Hello once again. Good morning. Good afternoon. All depends on where you are. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, speakers and participants, uh, we are happy to welcome you all in this important webinar organized by uh, the Global Forest Coalition's campaign against unsustainable livestock production. The webinar will focus on uh, unsustainable livestock and feedstock production globally in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the recovery from it. It is clearly demonstrated that the individual life, the industrial, the industrial livestock sector represents an estimated 14.5% of global Presenta 14.25% de las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero. Se ha demostrado que la pandemia ha facilitado la deforestación a nivel mundial, guiando a un incremento traumático en la destrucción. Contrary to the international agreed targets that aim to stop deforestation by 2020, those that intend to curb greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar aims to reflect on the following question. How can consumers, producers, policymakers, and NGOs, both in the global south and, and north, support resilient alternatives to sustainable livestock farming. To respond to this question and lead us to more reflections, we will have speakers from different regions who will dig deeper into the different strategies and approaches required to halt the expansion of agro-industrial livestock farming and to support the diverse range of more sustainable alternatives to this model. The time has come to building resilient alternatives to sustainable livestock farming. Having that said, and with no further ado, we will cover in uh, four sessions as follows. Session one, we're going to have uh, uh, Isis Alvarez to introduce the webinar. We'll hear from is this is this will tell us exactly why are we having this uh, webinar so the session two will focus on the presentations we will have all together six presentations the presenters will have uh, 10 minutes each to deliver their presentation in the following order the first presenter will be ines ines uh, Fran francelis the second presenter will be uh, carolina Calvani, followed by uh, Kwame, who will present Melinda's paper, uh, who is not here because uh, he cannot join us, but she signed her paper. Uh, so we're going to present that paper to all of you. So Daniel Jones will follow after Kwame, uh, followed by Stephanie and Kirtana uh, Chandra Sekaran will, will present uh, last before the uh, third session. So the third session will be Q&A, uh, question and answer. Participants uh, are asked to present their questions into the, into the uh, question and respond box. So the panelists can respond directly. So the question can be answered directly into the box or speakers will have the floor to answer them directly. Uh, and we'll go uh, for session four to finish uh, this uh, webinar. Then uh, Isis Alvarez will come back for closing remarks on the strategies to address unsustainable livestock farming from uh, a southern perspective. Having that said, the uh, presenters are here, I'm sure all of them are here. Uh, we're going to uh, start quickly with uh, the first presenter. As I said, Ines. Ines uh, will present on the alternatives to sustainable livestock farming 
proposed during the regional webinars. So Ines Francelis is trained in uh, communication and has worked in uh, mainstream media as well as business and organizational communication strategies. She is currently a researcher and advocate on issues related to the land conflict, agribusiness, and human rights violations. Ines, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, Kwame. Buenos días a los compañeros y las compañeras. Eh, voy a hablar brevemente de I'm going to speak briefly about the ideas that arose at the different regional dialogues that Global Forest Coalition held between 2019 and the beginning of this year, 2020. These were three dialogues. Latin America, Asia, and Africa. I'm not going to mention the diagnosis of the grave situation of the loss of food sovereignty, which implies the development of this unsustainable production model, both livestock and GMO crops associated with livestock. I'll speak directly about the, idea, the ideas about how to confront these, how to strengthen our resilience to confront this model. In the dialogues, we had the participation of representatives from academia and activist movements from around the world. Some basic things that came up were the need to involve women in decision-making, the urgency that these transformations require, and the fact that all initiatives should include as an objective halting climate change and the dimensions of animal welfare and its relationship to human health. With the food crisis unleashed by the current pandemic, COVID-19, this urgency becomes much more apparent. I'm going to organize these ideas which arose into different arenas of action. First of all, in the productive and territorial arena, participants around the world said that it's necessary to promote the replacement of production through conventional systems to replace that with agroecological and traditional production systems. And have land in the hands of peasants and farmers. The need to transform large land holdings. Also proposed the eradication of agrochemicals promoting agroecology and traditional agriculture, recovering crops and animal breeds that have disappeared, recovering traditional knowledge and traditional medicine, recovering local markets, rescuing and promoting the use of native seeds, also proposed was the need to strengthen alliances from the grassroots 
to strengthen associations between small producers, both for production and sale, and especially establish mechanisms for connection between producers and consumers to make the country and city closer together, which implies a new type of organization of food distri distribution that is distinct from that of capitalism. It was suggested to find ways to reverse the processes of urbanization of recent decades and that it's urgent to strengthen women's role in decision making regarding production, food, and policy. In the political arena, ideas for strengthening resilience were the following, to establish better mechanisms for affecting local governments, imposing real limits on unsustainable agricultural production, denouncing government incentives that support that production that is unsustainable, eliminating the financialization of food markets, and urging governments to fund research and not have it done by corporations greater knowledge about the role of banks in the livestock industry, recognizing the companies involved and the taxes on, raising taxes on unhealthy foods and reducing taxes on agroecological traditional production. In the arena of the media and awareness campaigns for consumers, to combat this unsustainable livestock production model, it's necessary to promote conscious consumption, including the need to reduce the consumption of meat and dairy. It is suggested to inform consumers about the health and environmental impacts of consuming meat and discourage the consumption of imported foods. Also proposed was collective commitments to spread information to people in the territories. To spread word about the impact of the poisoning of feedstock, the poisoning of industrial meat the impact of excessive meat consumption, the degrade degradation of soils implied by this model, the loss of biomass, including the loss of biodiversity and deforestation and the contamination of potable water. These were the main recommendations made by the participants in the dialogues that the coalition held around the world on how to confront this unsustainable production. Now, to finish, situ the situation right now in the southern cone of South America, where the imposition of monocultures and large-scale beef production have really reduced food production in recent years. And now, with the restrictions on food circulation, economic contraction and deterioration, millions of families cannot access a complete diet every day. And need the solidarity that is expressed through community kitchens. So mass production of very poor quality foods. 
The pandemic has shown what I said at the beginning, the urgency of transformations in production, distribution, and access to food that's healthy to keep the population of the world alive. And that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ines. I would like to recall that uh, Ines uh, is working for Hinoi, an organization based uh, in uh, Paraguay. Thank you once again uh, for, for bringing uh, uh, the importance of uh, women involvement in decision making processes. And also uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, the effect of COVID-19 uh, pandemic on, on, on small scale farming and farmers. And very importantly, uh, you put forward the recommendation that uh, there is a urgent need to, to transform so people are uh, taken care of. So thank you very much for your presentation. The second presenter is uh, Carolina Calvani. Carolina Calvani is uh, a Brazilian journalist, founder and the current CEO of uh, Synergia animal, an international animal protection organization working exclusively in countries of uh, the global south to promote more compassionate food choices. So Carolina, you are welcome and you have the floor. Um, hi everyone, I'm gonna try to share my screen first. Good. Two seconds, please. So before you resolve the, the technical uh, mm -hmm. uh, problem, can I can I ask uh, the participant to to send the question to the Q the Q and R box, please? If you do have question, please send them to, to, to that box. Then we take care of it. Thank you very much. You have the floor, Carolina. Thank you. Um, so thank you all. I'm very excited to be here today. So today Can I'm I? going to be talking about Oi. Oi. I start up um, and mostly about the internal market in Brazil, but also touching a little bit on uh, the key import markets of Brazilian soy and Brazilian beef. So the first thing to say is that uh, I think as we all know, the situation in Brazil is getting worse and worse. Uh, there is very little hope uh, to work with the current government. Deforestation levels are rising both in the Amazon and in the Cerrado. And during the, the COVID-19 crisis, we even had our Minister of Environment suggesting that we should use this crisis uh, to, to lower enforcement and protection of forests in Brazil. Um, so when we talk about uh, deforestation in the Amazon, uh, nowadays it, it is mostly about uh, cattle farming, when we talk about food of course, so uh, we have, uh, there is a recent study uh, published by Trace, which says that only 14% of deforestation generated by the production of, of beef is linked to exports, uh, to mostly to places like Hong Kong, China, and Russia. And 18% of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon is linked to the consumption of beef in the domestic market. Uh, when we look at soy, of course, soy is still driving deforestation in Brazil, but mostly in the Cerrado biome nowadays. Uh, and the situation here is a little bit different. Uh, we have exports um, leading, so 61% of soy production in Brazil is uh, goes for export markets and we have china there accounting for 97 97 percent of 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 total exports 
but the internal market is still important as well. We have 39% of our soy production uh, going uh, for the internal market. Uh, like elsewhere in the world, um, soy is mostly used uh, to feed farmed animals. Uh, so currently and sadly, uh, we have 1.7 billion animals, most of them being farmed in factory farms in Brazil. Uh, so Brazilian livestock production is, is very much industrialized, unsustainable and cruel. And we have very intensive methods, uh, especially in egg, pig and poultry production. It's also important to highlight that the Brazilian consumption of animal products is very high. Uh, we currently have a per capita consumption of 90 kilos per year, which puts us on a similar level to many high income countries. Uh, we have a lot of problems, but when we look at the consumer market, I think we also have a lot of things that could make us hopeful or a lot of potential that we can explore. So uh, nowadays we have a lot of very strong animal rights and animal protection NGOs working in Brazil. Uh, they have been able to grow uh, very fast on social media and together uh, they have millions of followers. We also have um, more and more celebrities or influencers um, adopting a plant-based diet in Brazil and uh, although we cannot confirm 100% I would say that this is leading to more and more people being aware of, of problems related to unsustainable livestock production in Brazil. So currently we have um, we already have 14% of the Brazilian population um, declaring to be vegetarian we have 60%, 63% of consumers uh, saying they want to reduce their meat consumption. Uh, we have around 19% of consumers already consuming organic and ecological products regularly. And we also have a survey that says that 87% uh, of Brazilians would prefer not to buy meat from confinement or industrial systems. Um, some great examples of interventions that are already being done by uh, national and international NGOs working in Brazil can be seen here. So in terms of reduction programs and campaign, and campaigns. Uh, Brazil already has the most successful Meatless Monday campaign in the world. Uh, the Brazilian Vegetarian Society, which runs the campaign, um, says the campaign already reaches 3 million st students in public schools nationwide and it keeps growing. And also in terms of plant-based alternatives, uh, we see a very significant progress here. So plant-based companies in Brazil are estimated to be growing at a rate of 40% annually. And 55% uh, uh, of Brazilians say that they would consume more vegan products if they were labeled as such. We also have uh, a lot of certifications kind of establishing themselves in the market. So we have certifications for products that are produced that for animal products that are produced organically uh, without uh, deforestation and also some looking at uh, social issues and of course animal welfare certifications. There is one in Brazil nowadays. Um, what I would say like like starting to talk about the, the potential that we have here to explore. Uh, one of the things to highlight is that Brazilian meat giants like JBS Los que eran las grandes compañías de carne en Brasil han contestado, han respondido. And all of them have adopted at least one major animal welfare policy in, in recent years. 
So for example, uh, these three I mentioned already have policies to phase out the use of eggs produced in battery cages and um, the production of pig meat using gestation crates. Uh, I would say that there is very little being done in terms of getting them to adopt standards for cattle production and also uh, getting them to have standards not to source soy from deforested areas. Uh, talking about our import markets, um, we know there has been a lot being done, um, there is a lot being done in Europe and as I said in the beginning that's very important, international pressure is really crucial for, for us right now in Brazil because there isn't much hope nationally in terms of working with the current government. But uh, when we look at the list of importers of Brazilian soy and beef, um, I would say that we have a lot of neglectedness here. So there are a lot of countries uh, that import uh, significant quantities of Brazilian soy and beef, where there is little capacity uh, to, to raise awareness with consumers and with governments about the problems. So last week on, on the World uh, Tropical Forest Day, we started doing this awareness work. We also work in Indonesia, in uh, Thailand and Chile. So we sent out a press release talking about the links between pandemics, deforestation and meat consumption in these countries. And it was very successful. We got um, a good number of media hits and some of them were mainstream. So um, the idea here is to say that there is room to do similar things in other importing countries as well. So that's all from me today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for your presentation. It's always good to end the presentation on the, on the good notes. Um, very interesting, very informative uh, uh, presentation. It's, it's uh, encouraging to, to know that the consumption of uh, organic and ecological products is on the rise. And also 87% uh, of consumers say they prefer to consume, uh, to consume animal products that uh, do not use a confinement system. I think, uh, I think it's good. And uh, the awareness uh, through media also is a good strategy to, to give information, to mobilize people towards the, the solution we want. Thank you once again. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the presentation from uh, Melina, but unfortunately Melina is not here. I'm going to present quickly uh, his paper. So she, she sent uh, the paper, so uh, it's from, she's from China. So Melina uh, is from uh, China and uh, she uh, is at the forefront of uh, promoting sustainable food system in China, working with consumers among other organizations and movements. So here I'm going to read quickly uh, her presentation. Uh, so we know what's going on in China in terms of uh, uh, sustainable livestock production and the consumer's uh, uh, role in that. So uh, he, her presentation is, is titled uh, Targeting Chinese Consumers, Producers and Policy Makers. So uh, it goes like this. In China, in the past 30 years, the general diet has shifted from uh, plant-based to animals. The consumption of animal meat has tripled and it's, st it's still increasing. The situation in China is just a micro microcosm of developing countries around the world. This is a vicious cycle. As the wealth of uh, developing countries accumulates, 
the animal protein that is more affordable than before, factory farming is introduced. Government policy is also inclined to promote the industry. More meat suppliers mean the development of the economy. Therefore, the price of meat is further reduced and people who are accustomed to cheap meat have begun to have demand for food prices, which makes the transformation of factory agriculture more difficult. As consumers, we will already pay for the price of the cheap meat system, pollution of water and agricultural land resources, animal diseases, and drug abuse such as antibiotics. But this information is not yet widely known to the public. For customers, we think the most important thing is to adjust to the plant-based diets and reduce meat consumption so that the industrial farming system can no longer be encouraged to expand. And within the economical acceptable range, by high animal welfare products. Also, you can learn more about the factory farming through documentary, news, and books, and help family and friends with better food choices. Manufacturers, producers should also better understand the inefficiency of factory farming systems and adopt high animal welfare system, such as non-caged system, free-ranged system, rotational size grazing, etc., etc., and also actively seek policies and corporation. Policymakers can reduce subsidize for large-scale factory farms and tile the policy to producer with more reasonable scale and producers of plant-based food. And NGOs can do a lot to benefit the whole system. Different NGOs are deeply involved in their field and have a deep understanding of systemic issues. However, we should be aware of the way we communicate with the public, policymakers, and manufacturers more diversely and acceptably approaches are needed. We should seek to common benefits for all, of, of, for all sides, not just talking to ourselves. At Good Food Fund, we are trying more diverse public engagement. This year, we will cooperate with Slow Food China and the local community at Suzu Design Week to transform the weight market locally. Through designing methods, we hope to talk about the harm of factory farming and better ways of purchasing food, promote plant forward eating diets. In China, the engagement between policymakers and the media is also very important. This year, we have also strengthened our cooperation with the Chinese official media, CCTV. In July, we will hold an online interview with them. In terms of the, 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 the term, we will talk about the food system and the epidemic in China. And also, we are aware of the Chinese government context this year. China's 2020 battle against uh, poverty. So we will also talk about how to help low-income food producers and farmers. Overall, we think it is good timing to engage the public about livestock farming. It is going to be a marathon. So this is the presentation from uh, 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 Melinda. 
So Melinda is uh, she's from China, uh, as I said. We're going to move uh, now to the next presenter. So before that, I want to recall that uh, participants are allowed to post the, the questions into Q, Q and, and R box. So the speakers can take care of the questions and answer them. Or um, we can be also online. The next presenter will be Daniel. Daniel Jones. Siguiente presentación es Daniel. Senior campaign manager at Feedback. Feedback is a campaign group working to regenerate. Él es un trabajo en Feedback. Feedback es un eh, una organización que se encarga de, de cambiar la percepción del público sobre el tema de la carne. If you are hearing me, you have the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be part of this call alongside such um, inspiring and knowledgeable panel. Um, I'm going to be speaking in English. So for those of you who are, um, like to listen in Spanish, there's translation available below. Um, I'm going to speak today about the finance behind unsustainable livestock production. And I'm going to start with a little story, um, not about livestock, but actually about an oil company. In the year 2000, a very large and very profitable oil corporation underwent a now infamous rebrand. Um, Beyond Petroleum became the new name briefly of the oil giant BP. And it might have been a marketing dream, but it is widely agreed to have been almost entirely meaningless when it came to changing how BP could be part of a truly renewable future. How could it when for a company like BP, their very business model is founded on the expansion and it's founded on shareholder payouts and it's incompatible with changing um, our future energy system. The five largest livestock companies, JBS, Tyson, Cargill, Dairy Farmers of America and Fonterra, they might not have the same name recognition of a big oil company like BP or Shell, but from the perspective of the sustainable future to all intents and purposes, um, they're in the same boat. Our argument at Feedback is that big livestock, like big oil, by its very nature, belongs on the wrong side of history. And so like the fossil fuel industry, big livestock is sustained by vast flows of public and private finance that prop up an extractive business model um, and an unsustainable business model. And without targeting these financial flows, change is unlikely to occur at the pace that's required in the context of deforestation, biodiversity loss, and the climate emergency. So, at feedback we're following this money what does that look like in practice well as an organization that's headquartered in london we're at the heart of a global center for private finance and so there are pressing questions that we can put to investors right on our doorstep about the impact of their actions and the impact that happen globally um, there's a story to tell about public finance and the development finance institutions but these arguments are better made from Abidjan or from Caracas than they are made from here in London. Um, so I'm going to show you a slide that to gives you an idea of what some of this money looks like. And so this is one small example of what following the money can look like. Until we know where it's going and who it comes from, there's very little we can do to target um, the financial institutions to put pressure on them to change the behavior. Um, and it is that is the pressure point that we think is most important. On the left hand side, you can see uh, the home countries of banks which lend to Brazilian meat companies. And so it, this will not be very new to many of you on the call that Brazilian meat is financed globally. But by tracking this flow of finance, we can begin to ask questions of the banks in Japan, in the Netherlands, in the United States, and 
here in the UK about their propping up of unsustainable and troublesome practices. So when we speak to investors or lenders or campaign to increase pressure on them so that they will put pressure themselves on the corporations that they fund, what, what do we here at Feedback want to see happen? Our argument is really straightforward. Increasing the checks that investors do, um, setting new rules for sustainability, worker or community rights or animal welfare are all positive actions. But in a climate crisis, they are not adequate alone. These are outputs, not outcomes. We're working towards a world without large industrial meat and dairy corporations, not better versions of them. And so we don't think these companies can transform their business models. Their emissions, um, their climate footprint and is intrinsic. Their need for land is inherent. JBS's business model is to produce more meat. The dairy giant Fonterra's business model is to produce more and more dairy. Innovation might stop the growth of their emissions, but it won't stop the growth of these companies' overall impact. And so in the fossil fuel sector, there's a really famous example of an energy giant, Dong, which transformed from an oil and gas company into a wind energy company called Alston. But these examples are fewer far between and could a meat company like JBS really become a low emission producer of agroecological pasture fed livestock in the future? Probably, probably not. And I'd question whether this is even a desirable outcome. Um, could it become a plant based burger giant of the future? Again, it seems unlikely. So we're following the money because we think it also forces consumers here in the UK to think beyond their dinner plates and question who funds the meat that is on them. It exposes the investors who are complicit in Amazonian deforestation, the universities that fund appalling labor conditions in uh, American uh, meat packing at slaughterhouses, and um, the museums and galleries that enable land grabbing um, in the South. So the food that we eat and where it comes from forms a direct link between those campaigning for a sustainable future and those on the front line of climate breakdown. Um, and so whilst today I've not spoken about the positive solutions, Inez and others on this call are much better placed to say things about that than I am. I'm today sort of making the argument that we need to focus much more on the vast flows of money that prop up the largest and worst offending agricultural corporations. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniels. Thank you for your presentation. I think uh, we need we need to be very careful and and also uh, target uh, uh, BP very well because uh, beyond petroleum, they are they are just changing names. <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think uh, we're going to move on quickly uh, to the next presenter. The next presenter will be uh, <clears throat> the next presenter will be Stephanie Stephanie uh, Islan. Uh, Stephanie leads the Trade and Animal Welfare Program at Euro Group for Animals the Pan-European uh, Animal Advocacy Organization representing 70 members based in the EU and beyond. Eurogroup for Animals, Trade and Animal Welfare Program acts as a constructive partner to uh, European Union decision makers offering WTO compatible solutions to problems identified in connection with trade and animal welfare. She represents a Euro Group for Animals on the Commission's uh, Expert Group on Trade Negotiation and on some of the uh, EU Domestic Advisory Group. Stephanie, thank you for joining us and thank you for uh, being here to present. You have the floor. Thanks so much for this kind introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. 
the topic I will present about is a bit more technical. I hope it's not going to be too boring for you. <laughs> Hello, here we are. Here we are. Up. I hope you can all see this. So today I'm going to talk about uh, an EU perspective. Uh, you're not all European listeners. So I'm going to talk about a new strategy that's been published in the EU, which is called Farm to Fork, and also about the EU Mercosur agreement. So more trade things. So I, went, I was kindly introduced, so I don't need to introduce you group for animals, but so basically our main action is to lobby at European level on behalf of our members who are based mostly within the European Union, but also outside. As you know, what happens in the EU can push other countries. And so that's why it's also important sometimes for countries, uh, for members not located in the EU. And my work on trade is allowed thanks to funding uh, from the organization you can see on the side. So it's always good to thank them. So I'm going to talk about the farm to fork strategy. It's part of what we call the EU Green Deal for the ones who are not European. It's been uh, dis described as the EU man on the moon moment by Ursula von der Leyen, the new president of the European Commission, the sort of European government. And um, it's clear that the strategy of the Green Deal is really sustainability and SDGs at its heart, at least in terms of the text. Huh? Let's be clear that many actions need to be taken. This is just a strategy and there is still a lot of negotiations ongoing, but it's, it's clearly a turning point that is important. And farm to fork is a bit the new EU food policy. And it was published in the midst of the COVID crisis in Brussels, so on the 20th of May. And it was interesting to see that a lot of industries and other stakeholders wanted the EU to postpone the publication of this strategy, saying it's not the right time to take those measures to go for greener uh, European economy and more resilient. No, that was not time for that. And the EU decided that actually the COVID crisis made it even more relevant. And so it was still published on the 20th of May. Uh, as you can see, it's about making EU food system fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly. The tweet you see on the right is from the commissioner, for the commissioner of uh, public health and food safety. And so she's the one in charge of all this. Um, as you can see, it's interesting to look at uh, the text per se. I'm not gonna go into details, it's quite long. What is, what is interesting is that in the introduction, there's a lot of facts that we are all using around, like talking about the fact that more plant-based diet is better than less meat consumption too, that it's good for health, good for the environment, that there's an, an environmental and health impact of uh, having a lot of uh, uh, meat consumption, that also there's an impact on, uh, on the environment other than climate. But of course, it's not really what we all wanted. It's not a systemic change, which is what we're talking about today. Is it really a move away from industrial agriculture? No, not yet. You can see the reaction of um, the European organizations, of our international organization who reacted to this strategy. You can see the European Environmental Bureau. You can see a lot of not really smiling faces on many points. You can see Greenpeace also being disappointed. A lot of the uh, negative impact of the meat is actually underlined, but uh, nothing is done about it. And you can see in the middle our tweets. Um, this strategy, we had to recognize a good point because it's the first time in 10 years that the EU is talking about having new animal welfare legislation. But us as well, we were wondering, will we be able to have the systemic change that we, we actually need in Europe and in the world in general in terms of consumption as well? So we could stop here and say, oh, it's not systemic change, but I think there is still um, battlegrounds for us and there are still avenues that we need to, to pursue in order to, to get some change in Europe and hopefully in the rest of the world too. So the farm to fork strategy is what it is. So a strategy that lists actions for the next four or five years. Um, one of the key ones for us, of course, is the revision of different animal welfare legislation, including one on slaughter and transport, but not only. So we're hoping, of course, to see a breakthrough in the current still made of like 10 years without any new animal welfare uh, rule at farm level in the EU. And of course, nothing is really written about what's going to be in there, but we are hopeful that we can make 
uh, of course, um, life better for animals. So basically also make um, livestock farming in the EU a bit more sustainable through this, uh, through this. As you know, animal welfare is very much linked to a lot of other crises. Uh, you've discussed this a lot already, so I won't go into details, but intensive farming is detrimental to animal welfare, but also to climate change, to the spread of zoonosis, uh, to antimicrobial resistance. So we, we hope that by going also for tighter animal welfare standards, we'll be able to get more sustainable farming in the EU. There is also a suggestion to have a new rule, a new law in the EU on what they call sustainable food production system. This as such doesn't say much, but the idea is basically um, to make sure that we make more, uh, we make common definition on what we mean by sustainable within the EU, and it should allow for more coherence for consumers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I don't know what other organizations intend to do, but definitely we intend to use this legislation as a as a as a tool. Of, uh, uh, yeah, a tool to make sure that, for instance, uh, intensive animal farming practices like caging, for instance, could be deemed unsustainable, which could help actually getting away from those practices. Again, this is a new battleground. It's not finished. There is not enough details to say it's a lost battle. It's not amazing either as such at the moment, but there are avenues for lobbying. I would like also to talk about what we call a promotion program. The EU is actually funding a lot of production of meat, for instance, in the EU. And leaked version of the strategy before it was finally published contained an amazing language that the EU would actually stop stimulating production and consumption of meat. So no promotion of this. We were, of course, all thrilled. This language disappeared in the final version thanks to a huge lobbying of the meat industry. And it's interesting to see, you know, we are scary now. They have to push a lot to get some language out of some text. So again, this is a bit of a disappointment, but still uh, it is written that the promotion programs in the EU will be reviewed in order to favor, um, you know, a food that is more in line with recommended diets. And the strategy says that plant-based, more plant-based, less meat is better. So we hope to see also the redefinition of the promotion program as a battleground to make sure there is less money going into all this. As Daniel said, money is very important. I wanted also just to underline, this is not a battleground, but that the strategy talks about 50% diminution of the use of antibiotics for farm animals and also in aquaculture. And that's definitely welcomed by most NGOs. And uh, um, another point, it's labeling. Many people, we talk about this. Labeling could be useful. The strategy talk about it in terms of empowering the citizens. We talked about this in Brazil, where we talk about the private sector moving and the, the consumers being able to make some informed choices. Um, we believe labeling is not a panacea. It doesn't solve the all issues. It is impossible for um, citizens to have to, you know, bear the entire weight of the decisions. So we do not want labeling as the only tool, but we believe it could be useful. And so the EU is discussing of a, label, a labeling system on sustainability, and in addition, something in annual welfare. So we're gonna see what they're gonna do, but we're gonna be active. Not every labeling is useful. We believe labeling is useful when it's mandatory, when it is imposed also to imported products. So this is going to be an important battle to avoid this label become just one in a jungle of useless labeling system. And finally, on trade, um, it's interesting to see that finally it is in the strategy. Trade policy should be coherent with our choices in Europe in terms of food policy. And there were a few. One good point is that the strategy calls for trade policy to be used to obtain commitments on animal welfare, antimicrobial resistance, and pesticides from third partner. We don't know yet how it's going to be implemented in practice, but that's a progress. There is also mention of a legislation on imported deforestation that could be useful and on due diligence. Uh, so at EU level, not only French level, but throughout the, the value chains, that could be useful. 
So I'm now going to talk about the Mercosur Agreement. Uh, as you know, it's been concluded in June 2019, and the next step is ratification within the EU and within Mercosur countries. And it generated a lot of controversy in the EU. A lot of mem several member states have already said that they, they do not want to sign it at the moment. France, you have the Parliament also in Ireland and in uh, the Netherlands who voted some motions about this. Uh, France might do that soon. Austria also has in its governmental agreement that they won't agree to it. So there are a lot of discussion. Also, very recently, the French and the Dutch have produced together what we call a non-paper on sustainable development in trade, criticizing the current approach of the EU on this. So it makes it very unlikely that the agreement might be signed at this moment. But the debate is also in Mercosur countries huh, about jobs, about indigenous rights, about environment, like in the EU. So as you know, it's an agreement that has a political side, which is usually not very interesting to many people because very soft cooperation mechanism and then a trade part, which opened most of the market without any condition related to sustainability or to animal welfare in my case. And there are, of course, chapter on cooperations that can be useful for us and one on trade and sustainable development. So what do we see? What's the impact of this on moving away from industrial farming? For us, it's very bad and we want to oppose it because basically the agreement per se would open trade a lot in animal products without, for most of the product, any condition on sustainability and animal welfare. It should lead to the increase of production, but also the intensification of production for animal products in Mercosur countries, but also in the EU, in pig meat, in dairy, in Mercosur countries for the chicken, but also for the beef, where we see more and more feedlots in, in those countries where there used to be only pastures. And you know that this, we, we said it, the intensification of animal farming is really very impactful, very detrimental impact on deforestation, so also on wild animals as individuals suffering from the loss of habitat, but also for climate for antimicrobial resistance, and more recently the spotlight was on zoonosis, and it's very important too. We also believe as European organization that this agreement will lead to having less checks on the ground to see whether the companies respect standards that are imposed in terms of animal welfare when there is one which is slaughter for the EU. And also we might face some limitations in terms of labeling. As I mentioned to you before, this is something we want to have. So basically there's a lot of potentially concrete negative impacts. And also in terms of uh, the political mood, it's very negative because it's, it's really an agreement that will favor exchanges in beef, which is very detrimental to climate, to forest and cars. So it really seems outdated. But many, people in like many uh, governments who support the agreement will tell you but it is the agreement doesn't create any any of these issues and it provides more channel of cooperation to actually fix them so it's good we should have it we do not believe that yes the agreement does not create these issues but it will fuel them which is not something we want considering the level of gravity of all these issues at the moment we also believe that the cooperation provisions that have been put into place are really weak and doesn't show, they do not show any, any sign of being respected in the sense that when you have those cooperation mechanisms, they have to be, they are linked to political willingness and resources. And we do not believe those countries want to do much on this. The EU past experience on this doesn't show us that it does much with those cooperation provisions. And also the EU had suggested a way more ambitious language and Mercosur countries downgraded it. So we do not believe there is political willingness there. We believe the best would be to condition any opening of the market to sustainability criteria and in our case, animal welfare related criteria. Basically you get better prices if you respect equivalent standards to what we have in the EU, because relatively it's often higher, but if it was better in the other country, we would say in the other country. And the, on, the other point that you might hear is that, yes, it's great, it contains a mention to the Paris Agreement, but do not believe that. The language, yes, it's there, but you have no way to implement this chapter. It's basically, if I take a bad example, but if Brazil decides to very obviously not respect the Paris Agreement, even if it's still a part of it, 
The only thing the EU could do is have a panel with them, have a report stating that, but then there is nothing. So basically, we believe that this agreement brings us even more into industrial farming and doesn't make it easier to actually go towards alternatives. So I'm going to stop here because it's already very long, but I'm happy to reply to any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, I think you have uh, questions on the chat box. You can you can you can got them and uh, and answer them. Thank you for bringing uh, uh, some uh, uh, good topics and also uh, you draw our attention to uh, the policy work. Uh, very important to uh, look at the, legisl the legislations uh, to support. Altern uh, alternative model uh, of production. I think uh, we need to push for good legislations uh, so that uh, the alternative that we are talking about uh, should be uh, considered. So legislation is, is very uh, is very good point. Uh, having that said, I think some questions are there for for all panelists. I'm happy that uh, you've been uh, uh, answering them. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the next speaker, the next speaker, and uh, I think uh, final final presentation will be uh, Kirtana. Kirtana Chandra Sikaran is the Friends of the Earth International Food Sovereignty Program co-coordinator. She has uh, spent over a decade fighting for food sovereignty and against the injustice of the industrial food system in India, the UK, and Europe. I'm very happy to welcome uh, Kirtana uh, to present. Uh, Kirtana, you have the floor. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Hello, Kirtana. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can't actually start my video. Um, I think the host has to start it, but I will start and uh, at some point maybe you'll see me. Ah, okay, perfect. So thanks. Uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me to be here. It's fascinating actually um, to hear about the different contexts and what's happening. So I was kind of asked to give a more global picture, let's say, of the the ways in which consumers and food producers and policymakers can make changes to support alternative systems. So I'm going to try to do that. It's quite broad. Um, so yeah, so without further ado, I don't have a presentation, but um, I'm going to make a few different points about each issue. I think one of the, the first thing I want to say actually is, um, I think for all of us who are working on this issue, um, I think, there is increasingly a really strong need to place the discussion about meat in, its, in a systemic context, always. Meaning the fact that the fight against factory farming is kind of emblematic of the need of a total transformation of our food systems to address environmental, social, gender, economic, and racial justice. Um, and you know, you can't get away from the fact that the rise of factory farming was not an accident. It's a consequence of years of neoliberal policies, capitalist agriculture systems. You can't have cheap meat without the rise of commodity farming and plantations, which have their own history of oppression and profit maximization to the exclusion of everything else. And the reason I say that is because, um, it's, uh, very true, you know, when, when Daniel, for example, was talking about the big five meat companies, nobody would name them. And what I find sometimes uh, interesting and concerning about the discussion about meat is that, for example, if you, you know, more and more people, if you talk about climate change, understand the structural problems that you could not stop fossil fuel extraction unless you stop the corporate control of that whole supply chain. But the discussion on meat, at least in the mainstream, is very much not at that stage. So I think that oh, should be a worry for all of us. So having said that, um, the question of alternatives, of course, is a bit tricky because in many places, as you all probably know, who've been part of this process, especially 
especially in Africa and Asia, but even in some places in Latin America, um, low input or small scale livestock farming is still the norm. So, you know, we have several million, over 600 million small scale farmers, uh, 200 million or more um, pastoralists and herders. So a lot, of the, a lot of the discussion about how you keep the alternatives is about how you stop the rise of factory farming. So, you know, the two are very closely interconnected. Um, and, you know, one of the issues that we need to address is to show why they cannot coexist. A lot of international institutions will support, they do have started to support agroecology in some way, but, um, you know, that there are different strokes for different folks kind of thing. So you can have this intensive system with a long supply chain for some things and agroecology for some things, and that absolutely doesn't work because one of the one of the basis for the industrial livestock system is the kind of accumulation of wealth by dispossession of land of people's rights of gender rights of all these things so that is uh, i think one of the key things and as all of you have said very eloquently i think the factory farming is supported by a incredible web of public policy support so you know subsidies direct production for feed intellectual property on genetic breeding. Um, you know, there, there are things that I know we don't can't touch on everything here, but a lot of what low wages, uh, lack of labor regulations, that's huge on um, allows factory farms to exist, basically. Lack of environmental regulations or a free pass on them. And the two really big things for me, uh, which have been touched on here is the, the corporate control, the power of co corporations in every stage um, of the chain and trade agreements, trade and investment agreements, which uh, I very much agree with uh, Stephanie. I think that they are, they are a driver, in fact, of factory farming. <laughs> you cannot say that they are not a driver for various reasons, which I'll go on. Uh, yeah, so it's just to say it's a little bit tricky. So I will kind of talk about both because prevention is a large part of the cure, at least for, for many places in the world. So having said that, um, in terms of addressing consumers, um, I think, so our, our role uh, as Friends of the Earth is very much not to talk to people as consumers, but more as kind of uh, citizen consumers, if you like, or I don't know, people call them in different ways here. I heard somebody say responsible, or may, uh, sorry, I can't remember. But um, I think there are several things that needs to be done about this discussion about consumption in general, you know, which is addressed more, mainly at consumers. So the one thing I think is the need to move away from the resource efficiency or carbon efficiency narrative around meat. Uh, and that's the biggest one, right? People talk about that a lot and it's true. Um, but unless you place it in a more uh, systemic context, as I was saying about everything, uh, biodiversity, land rights, the several things that, that happen. One is that you can start to focus on um, unhelpful issues. So now, for example, the issue of red meat, which across the world is kind of being vilified, but not so much pig and poultry production. Um, and that's a huge problem because actually most of the growth, I think 80% of the growth in factory farming is going to be pig and poultry who are massive consumers of soy. And it's not that red meat is not a problem, but it can not be a problem in some places. Um, the second thing that we see happening a lot when you do this in um, international institutions is that you get this um, carbon efficiency narrative, which is now what, for example, the FAO, uh, UNEP are all set to, you know, it's carbon efficiency per unit of production of meat. And that's very obvious where that goes, right? Because all the New Zealand and the industrial countries come out much better in terms of production. So that is one of the things I wanted to say. The second thing is, um, I think a more, a more tricky one that you know, it, I think would be great to have discussion on is this issue of can you solve the problem by individuals eating less meat? And I, it's not to say that you shouldn't talk about that as in there's no way to get around the issue that a large parts of populations will need to start consuming less. Um, but is that going to, solve the problem when all the structural things behind it are pushing cheap meat onto people. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. 
the last thing is uh, that in the consumption debate, so I, I obviously work at a global level, but I am in Europe and I see a lot of the discussion happening here is painting meat itself as the problem. And that is, so I know all, probably all of you realize why that's, that's problematic, but one of the things, one of the reasons why it's problematic is that it, it then becomes this kind of battle between corporate giants for who's controlling the narrative. So for so-called, you know, meat alternatives, who are also backed by, if it's not livestock industry, by massive uh, processed food giants like PepsiCo or um, people like that, and the meat industry. And that's certainly not the world that we want to see. So, um, so uh, that's it. And the, the last thing um, I want to say about consumption is that uh, it's, it's very important and to also think about it uh, as people were talking about here of the rising consumption in the, in the global South, in so-called um, BRICS countries, uh, but also elsewhere, which is going to be the match. I mean, the US and Europe are kind of saturated in a way, although poultry is still going up. Um, but when, when that analysis is happening, most of the time it stops when people say rising incomes and urbanization are the reason for the growth in production in consumption of livestock products in the developing world. And that is true, but it's very important to understand why and what's behind that. So you look at only those, but when you dig a little bit more, so what happens when you have rising income and urbanization, what happens is you have increasing access to um, fast food. So that when it goes hand in hand with trade liberalization and investment agreements, so like FDI, uh, in food retail and fast food, for example, in India, where I'm from, or in China, these two things together give people a huge amount of access to cheap processed food over what they would. So I think we shouldn't take that as a given. You know, a lot of policymakers would like to say, yo, you know, but you know, in the global south, this is happening, it's not us, and so you need to address there, but how is it happening and why? So that's why I say, I think for me, addressing the corporate control of every stage of the supply chain, from production to the livestock giants, to marketing, uh, retail, retailer supermarkets in Europe are a massive problem. Um, and also fast food companies and processed food companies is uh, going to be a big one. Um, so having said that, that's just the issues I want to bring up about consumers and the consumption angle. As far as food producers go, obviously it's not a monolithic group, as you all know very well. There's agribusinesses. There are plenty of farmers who are locked into the system because of the structural causes, don't necessarily want to be there. Um, and then there's a lot of small scale farmers and who are mostly agroecological, if not all. Um, and in terms of that, I mean, there's, there's plenty of food producer uh, movements and organizations who are already very well organized in terms of fighting back. Just a, a reasonably recent example was in India who were um, mainly the food producer organizations, small scale food producers mobilized against the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. So India has between 50 and 70 million small scale dairy producers who are still small scale. And this partnership agreement would have decimated the dairy sector. So they were able to mobilize to fight back. So that I think there's plenty going on and I wouldn't want to um, say too much about what those movements are doing because they lead themselves. Um, but I think one thing that was very interesting now, especially in the, in the um, aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, is this uh, attempt or, you know, to, to build broader coalitions between food producers, but also workers, uh, migrants who work on, on farms and in uh, meatpacking plants, for example, and also consumers or conscious consumers as you want to call it and that I think could be really powerful because the chain has a lot of has a lot of negative impacts on huge sections of people like we saw in the US uh, now with uh, and in Germany now with the coronavirus cases in meat plants. The last thing I'll say about maybe the food producers is that um, when we talk about agroecology, agroecology is not you know, it's not a you're in or you're out. It's a process. So, you know, we talk about agroecological integration. So it's, it's a line, a spectrum 
on which you can start to be somewhere, but the aim should be to be fully integrated in an agroecological system. So I say this because, you know, even, so there are several things you can do as a starting point, for example, um, change from monoculture farming, try to, instead of, you know, uh, having fertilizer on your farm, have organic, organic inputs, but ultimately the aim should be to have a kind of circular farm, to have ecological management, and then of course all the social issues as well, short supply chains. So that should be the kind of aim when for, for policies on um, the food production side. Um, so yeah, I mean, the last issue is about policymakers, and this is obviously, as you all know, a huge, a huge thing because there's really so many different types of levers that are uh, ensuring factory farming is expanding um, and small farmers are being dispossessed and uh, yeah. So I think the one thing I would say is that, again, talking about the systemic nature, the aim should be to situate this in the need to shift towards a model of food sovereignty. Uh, and by doing that, you can say, while, you know, one of us, you can't eat, you know, we work on specific aspects of that, but recognizing that we would need this kind of systemic change to happen in order to stop the rise of factory farming. So, and of course, the other thing to say is that different places are in different, are in different situations. So you could not have the same types of policies everywhere. But some of the things that I think uh, would be very important is land, security of land tenure, and to stop dispossession. Uh, in Europe and the US, of course, there would be things like uh, land concentration and changing farm size ownership and distribution and land reform in many countries. Again, uh, the free trade agreements, which I think are um, a, a really, really big historically cause of the decimation of small scale um, livestock, but also the rise of um, industrial livestock. So the, you know, free trade agreements along with the model of export led growth for saturated markets is going to be huge for the future. So just, you know, some concrete examples is in the TPP agreement um, that was being negotiated a couple of years ago one of the one of the key elements in there was to open up public procurement to um, other countries. So you could not anymore use public procurement as a tool to push for relocalization or sustainable procurement or anything like that. The um, regional comprehensive economic partnership, as I mentioned already, with India, which would have destroyed India's dairy farmers, which was now India stepped out of that, but is now negotiating a trade agreement with the U.S which would have worse or exactly the same problems. Um, so these have really, really dramatic effects on producers, but also imports of cheap, highly processed foods. Um, the next one is, of course, on fair prices. And this is linked to, again, corporate control, but it's linked to the also, again, um, this kind of neoliberal dogma where many countries are, were, you know, that any kind of agriculture policy was kind of dismantled through the 70s, 80s, uh, where you could not now have supply management systems or price boards or wage boards um, of, or things like price support, price support mechanisms, grain reserves, which would be a big thing for, um, to allow small scale farmers to, you know, have source local feed. Um, the next one is the subsidy systems, which people, a lot of people have talked about the money flow, <laughs> and that's a huge thing. I won't say anything more about it, but also, you know, other than private finance, there's also public subsidies. So, you know, there's like the EU pays several hundred million for just the cattle industry alone. And if that was redirected to supporting um, farmers to make the agroecological transition, then it would have a huge impact. Um, just the last few things that I want to mention in terms of uh, maybe policies that have not been mentioned so far is on um, addressing food poverty and social protection programs, 
which can be also linked then to relocalization and agroecological schemes. So there's lots of good examples of this through public procurement, but also um, consumer supported agriculture and promoting that. And now it, it's again quite interesting um, <coughs> in the reaction <coughs> of communities uh, to the COVID crisis where they are once again looking for those kind of local markets. So you have that on the one hand, but then on the other hand, um, in the countries in the global south where the vast majority of people actually rely on territorial markets and not on global supply chains have been hit really hard because they have not made an attempt to allow those, those territorial markets to stay open. Um, and the last two things, one is research and investment, which I think um, somebody touched on here, but that's also huge uh, in terms of, uh, well, one, one side of it is stopping intellectual property um, on breeding. Uh, the research that goes into agroecology is pretty much zero uh, in, in, in any region. And also the last one I would say is on workers' rights and labor regulations across the supply chain. And this, you know, we've seen that the factory farming model cannot exist without very, very cheap, a nonstop supply of very cheap labor and flexible labor, uh, which again is something that's really come to light now during the COVID crisis. And if that is something that they have to address, or, you know, if, if the power of, of the worker movement was stronger, I think that would go a long way to halting the rise of factory farming. Thank so you. I'm thank you. not sure how long it took, but I will leave it there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for the presentation. Uh, I think you have mentioned clearly that uh, we need to put uh, the discussion uh, into the systemic context. So everything is there. And uh, yeah, you have also uh, talked about the role of uh, uh, policymakers, and we need to push for land tenure, uh, land reform. That's very key. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it's time to uh, thank you all. And uh, we have some question. Uh, and that is a, a question, uh, a pending question uh, from uh, Kamal. What is the best alternative solution for intensive farming? I think this question is for Ketana, I think so. Uh, the question is for Kamal. So what I will do, uh, if someone feel like he can respond to, to this question, uh, what is the best alternative solution for intensive farming? Feel free to, uh, to have uh, the floor and answer the question. Kiptana, do you, do you feel like you have a, an answer to, to this question? Or, uh, or Ines? And also thank you for, for questions that have already uh, response. Uh, I've seen the... También gracias por haber contestado ya algunas preguntas en el chat. Algunos han contestado, pero todavía tenemos esta pregunta de, desde Kamal, que pregunta, ¿cuál es la mejor solución alternativa a la agricultura intensiva? Sí, me has preguntado a mí, pero no estoy segura de que entiendo completamente esta pregunta. Where do we go if we don't have intensive farming what can we do or how do you get intensive farming to change um to more sustainable models you can clarify okay, so i see ines also yeah thank you kirtana i see ines also uh, want to respond ines quiere responder. thank you kwame thank you kamal in my opinion, human beings have chosen 
10 a 12 mil años y esa forma de producir y consumir ha definido la organización de la sociedad, sociedades sedentarias, comunitarias. Ese, esa evolución humana, ese camino de la historia humana se rompió hace unas cuatro décadas cuando se nos, las empresas nos imponen esta nueva forma de producir y consumir organizada a partir de la concentración de la tierra, del control de los recursos productivos por un puñado de, de empresas, cada vez menos empresas, controlando todo el modelo productivo. Y esa imposición ha roto la capacidad humana de proveernos de alimentos para nuestra sobrevivencia. Y ha roto la, la sostenibilidad ambiental del, del planeta. La alternativa, desde, la perspectiva, desde nuestra perspectiva de Geñoy, la alternativa a esta producción no sostenible es recuperar la fortaleza de las fincas campesinas tradicionales e indígenas tradicionales que se caracterizan por pequeñas parcelas muy diversificadas, integradas, en el sentido de que todos todo los rubros producidos en las fincas son necesarios para el equilibrio de la finca, sin uso de agrotóxicos, privilegiando el comercio de cercanías, evitando, por supuesto, el transporte de larga distancia de lo producido. Esa, esa agricultura tradicional que todavía conserva razas adaptadas, tanto de ganado como de eh, cultivos vegetales, que todavía conserva conocimiento climático de suelos, eh, de control de especies no deseadas, llámense malezas o insectos. Esa agricultura viene resistiendo heroicamente el otro modelo. Desde nuestra perspectiva, la, la posibilidad de sobrevivencia de la especie humana depende de la capacidad que tengamos para replegar el modelo no sostenible y potenciar la agricultura tradicional campesina e indígena. Hasta ahí. Thank you, Inés. Uh, I hope uh, Kamal is satisfied. Um, yeah. So um, I have uh, another another question from uh, from uh, uh, Kamal. So we have two questions now. Uh, unfortunately, the questions are not on the Q, Q and, and, and R box, but I'm going to read them from, from the, the general chat. Uh, the question is, uh, the, the first one is, does the uh, F2F strategy talks about uh, greenhouse gas emission or any relation to climate change? I think this one is for uh, Steph, Stephanie. And the second question uh, for Stephanie again, how does uh, F2F strategy intersect with the EU Mercosur deal? Stephanie, if you are there, can you respond to yeah. those questions, please? Yeah, of course, thank you for those questions. Um, I'm not a specialist of uh, carbon emissions, but um, the Green Deal per se, the main objective is basically 
announced it has to be US rich carbon neutrality, I think by 2015, I'm not wrong. And so basically uh, in the Green Deal, which is the overarching strategy, it is written uh, that there will be a climate law, which will be much more talking about all those issues. Um, what you find in, um, in the Green Deal 2, you find mention of a, bar, a carbon border tax adjustment mechanism, so a tax that you could impose to imported products. Um, if you want, uh, if the countries, for instance, do not have similar programs in terms of decarbonization. But uh, Farm to Fork says on food safety. So it's, it does discuss the impact on climate as an introduction of the certain diets and something like that, but it does not go technically in details about um, getting to carbon neutrality because that's going to be what's going to be done by this climate sort of law that is going to come soon. I think it's next year. It's not really my topic. Now, the intersection um, between Farm to Fork and um, Mercosur agreement, unfortunately, there's not many in the sense that, um, as I said, the agreement, um, it has been negotiated for the past 20 years. So can you imagine how outdated the mandate of those negotiations are, even though they were slightly modernized around 2010, 2015 or so, a bit, but they haven't really changed much, the, the language of what was supposed to happen. And the tax has been concluded in July 2019. So even before we had a new government commission, European Commission, which had this, this, this idea to really be around this green deal and have you know a more sustainable policy so yes the eu Mercosur agreement as it stands now really seems even more at odds with the direction that the eu wants to take we have been underlining this a lot there has been debate in the european parliament for instance between on the really on this on uh, how aligned the eu Mercosur is with the green deal how compliant it is with the green deal objective in majority, MEPs are a bit dubious about this, but you always have the ones who really support free trade, uh, as was explained by Kirtana too, really believe in this. And so basically for geo geopolitical also reasons. And uh, yeah, so for us, Farm to Fork came afterwards, only recently, almost a year after this agreement was concluded, but it really underlines the incoherence between the EU trade policy and what the EU is trying to do internally to be more sustainable on food, but also on other topics. So it is really interesting because, yeah, it doesn't make much sense to have a disagreement now in the current debate among member states about trade. The, the trade dimension was really absent from, it was really a, a big dispute internally within the commission on how it was going to be included in Farm to Fork. There was really a fight not to have mentioned that trade can have a bad impact on food policy, on our standards, and so on. Uh, at the end of the day, there are some good language, but there is also no recognition of the bad impact of trade, except on the forest, for instance, from the, importing, the exporting countries, aka recognizing the impact of deforestation, for instance, in Brazil, that is linked to imports into the EU. But so no, there is a big, big battle. We know there's internal disagreement within the EU commissions. If you look at the vice president of the EU commission, Franz Timmerman, who works on the Green Deal, he wants trade to be more you know, compliant and changeable, but there is a lot of resistance in uh, the Ministry for Trade, in DG Trade. And so we hope that uh, Mercosur will be, the agreement with Mercosur and the opposition that it will generate, we really push the EU into reviewing the way they're doing trade policy. At the moment, there is what we call a trade policy review. So the EU will produce a new trade strategy. Of course, we're going to contribute. And yeah, there is, yeah, there is a lot of contradiction and no intersection, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe the last, the last, the last question uh, uh, is about uh, GMOs. I would like to hear from uh, uh, Daniel, Kirtana, and, and Stephanie, maybe Carol, Carolina also. Uh, how is GMO or ELMO promotion for sustainable production in the uh, European Union? Is there any debate on, 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 on GMOs as uh, uh, sustainable production in the uh, uh, European Union uh, 
If I can say one thing on this, because I think maybe Kirtana yeah. will know more, there is uh, some language that we are cautious about in Farm to Fork because they mention uh, the need to go towards more precision agriculture. In terms of animals, of course, what we care about is all the discussions about gene editing and the fact that you might improve the welfare of animals by, for instance, modifying them genetically so they don't have horn, so you don't need to dehorn them or making them more resistant to a certain pathogen. But, you know, this is really not looking at all the welfare impact of just the testing of this. And I'm not going to start this debate. But so there is a discussion in the year gene editing is seen as similar to gene modification and so it requires an approval to be on the market and at the moment it's the same process but so yes there is a discussion more about precision agriculture and those things so we will have to be careful about what they do but probably others know more really on the agricultural side of things Kirtana, do you, do, you, do you have to, to add yeah, I think that's that's yeah, probably the main point. Uh, as far as what we would call normal old GMOs are concerned, the first generation GMOs, I think there's still quite a lot of opposition in Europe. There have been many attempts to to push it through, but uh, there's still quite a lot of consumer opposition to that. There are some countries now um, which have historically been pro GM anyway, like the UK which are now trying to open up again. Um, so that's ongoing. The, the big new worry is in fact what Stephanie said, that the new generation, so gene editing technologies, um, that there is a process now uh, to see whether they're gonna go through the same approval process or will be considered um, as safe. So that's, that's quite a big worry. And it's not just in the EU, it's a global, it's a global push in fact, to bypass regulation for new gene editing techniques. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before before we close, uh, I, will, I, will, I would like to, to hear the, the last word from, uh, from all presenters. What will be your, 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 your key strategy? What uh, you, you can tell us? A very, very simple and key uh, that uh, we can carry on just to promote uh, uh, the alternatives. What do you think? And maybe very shortly, uh, two minutes each or three minutes each. Thank you. Can we start with uh, Kitana as you are you are on? You are mute. You are you are on mute. Yes. Uh, in terms of strategies, it's difficult to pick one because our work uh, will be probably we work quite a lot on pushing public policies for agroecology to flourish um in in every place um and then a, a lot on trade policy as well and investments um so i think that will continue to be our big push yes thank you uh stephanie Yes, um, as Kirtana, we will be very, and uh, Friend of the Earth is with us on this, we are going to have really a lot of actions about the Mercosur 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 agreement um, with a lot of NGOs from Europe, but also from Mercosur countries. So that's going to be a big priority for me. But in terms of my colleagues also, they're going to work a lot on the fields that I have mentioned on Farm to Fork. So on reviewing the EU animal welfare legislation to make them more updated in terms of science, but also on the sustainable food production sort of legislation and on any of those topics that could allow us to further move the EU away from intensive farming, which is not the case at the moment. So it's hard to ask our partner not to do it when we do it too. So yes, this is going to be, I guess, for a lot of opportunities, a lot of work to come. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Caroline. Yes, from our perspective, our work is pretty much focused on trying to make big supply chains uh, less harmful and less unsustainable. Uh, we fully recognize and we agree that like structural changes in terms of legislation and financial incentives are very needed. 
but we also think that for us to to see the world that all of us want to see that is more focused on ecological farming and very supportive of small scale agriculture we also have to make the the big scene the big production scene less worse <laughs> i would say so we are pretty much focused on pushing major animal welfare reforms in big supply chains and also uh, starting pretty much to build the movement we we work in 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 countries where farm animal protection issues are very small and very young we call them neglected countries in the sense because there isn't much being done in them so it's pretty much we are in the stage of raising awareness with consumers and building the movement, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel? Thank you. Um, so as quickly as I can, um, to redirect um, finance, attention and resources um, out of the um, across the supply chain out of the things that are bad and towards the things that are more positive away from industrial animal agriculture and towards um, sustainable agroecological production um, so redirect um, and regulate um, so across again across the supply chain looking to regulate the corporations um, not through voluntary agreements but actual legislation with teeth um, to uh, to curtail the worst of the practices. Yeah. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Ines. Desde nuestra visión, el problema de fondo. From our perspective, the the problem is production model las comunidades humanas sobre todo la población urbana necesitamos revolucionar transformar profundamente nuestra manera de consumir esa va a ser la clave para cambiar las matrices productivas los humanos hemos daña hemos llegado tan lejos en nuestra irresponsabilidad que estamos dañando irreversiblemente las condiciones para la sobrevivencia. La clave que promueve Geñoy es revisar en profundidad las formas de consumo para frenar la destrucción y para obligar al cambio de, la, de las formas de producir. Necesitamos imaginar mundos completamente diferentes. Necesitamos soñar con sociedades completamente diferentes. Y necesitamos frenar nuestro consumo irracional. Eso, eso es por ahora. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, I think uh, it's also very key to continue to También es eh, clave para empezar a crear este movimiento y identificar alternativas. Y es muy importante. Hemos llegado al fin de este webinario. Ya llamar a ISIS para las para cerrar el seminario y que no sé sus las, las últimas cláusulas. ISIS, gracias. Por, eh, por invitarnos, tienes la palabra.
You are you are muted. Sorry, sorry. So thank you, Kwame, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, the moderators. Thank you, the interpreters. Thank you, the attendees. Uh, I will do a quick wrap up of what has been said today. I think we we are confronting a very big problem, but I see this is getting somewhere slowly. Um, um, in the in the face of the lack of the possibility to work with governments, which is the case of many, many governments in the South, such as Brazil or Colombia. I, I see that consumer power or, or public pressure is one of the, of the tools or the weapons that, that we need to, to strengthen, just as Ines said. Uh, we have seen that there have been customer, customer changes over time uh, the fact that there's more and more vegetarianism, not just in the global north, but also in countries uh, here in South America. There is a sign that the, there is a progress in, in a shift that we're looking for. However, we need to be, we need to be aware that the, the corporate corporations have gained such a huge power that it's not that easy to defeat them, but the, that there is potential from from consumers to to be able to curb this uh, sort of abuses from the from the big corporations and the model that put the corporations on top of of, of the control of the food supply chain at least uh, along with vegetarianism there are other possibilities uh, i personally got acquainted with the reducitarianism which is also a sort of a a strategy that each person that e that we individually can take as consumers and i think all of these uh, small decisions could definitely lead to a food revolution of course we need more uh, policy support uh, uh, policies that actually use the financial investments the, the financial flows towards cleaner produce toward healthy diets towards organic farming farming and at the same time, uh, shift the situation in a way that there is a boycott on industrial systems. Now, if the certification or labeling is the question, uh, uh, is, the, is the solution, uh, I don't know. I mean, this could be a tool. I know there have been lots of problems with certification, especially because of the model itself, because the, the model allows for for fake certification systems which is very unfortunate because when there is really a certification that takes all the time to to make sure that that it's uh, an ethical one uh, it, this doesn't happen with with all of the different labels so i think there but that, but there is a possibility for 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 it to happen the other question that i wrote that arise here is the um, the fact that are we we are pushing for more plant-based diets, which many in many countries and many cultures we have used traditionally, uh, beans, um, peas, uh, but now we are confronted with this uh, marketing strategy of uh, the fake meat or lab meat, or that is also within the spectrum of, of plant-based. And we found out that there's a lot of meat corporations are also uh, into this industry of the plant-based. So I think we do need to keep an eye on, on what exactly is plant-based and what is the kind of plant-based that we want. Because the kind of plant-based that we want is actually what has been said here and is the one that also strengthens food sovereignty that al allows for local pro food producers to to empower, to be empowered, to continue with the traditional farming, to continue their life subsistence activity, and not the kind that continues to, to feed the, the, mod, the unsustainable model, just like Kirtana said. And, and the fact that, that we need a systemic change doesn't mean that by just pushing for, for, for an, a, an option that looks like is the savior of a problematic uh, that we could blindly support it so i think we need to be critical about what the alternatives that are being offered are and try to recognize and support those that definitely have the different um, 
pillars or areas uh, that is not just the economic, but that also comes to the uh, Am I there? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear I'm you. Back? Okay. So yes. So I, let's continue. I don't know where I where I where you lost me, but uh, just to to is, to make it easier in, in for the time. I think uh, the media campaigns in importing countries are also important. Uh, I am a bit worried that there seems to be an understanding that because uh, uh, because uh, importing countries are the ones causing big damage. There's a little bit of neglect on, on the same policies that exporting countries have. So we, could, we can see this uh, in Brazil now that the, the problematic is, is so evident, but we can also see it in Paraguay, for example, or in Colombia. I want to, I want to bring an example that came last week that was very, very shocking. And is the fact that there are now live cattle imports from from different countries, and this was the case that from Colombia. They sent uh, the thousands of, of heads of cattle to Egypt, and they were stopped in Spain, and they found the animals in really appalling conditions. So I think the the, the media campaigns that can be affected effective also need to bring up the issues both in north and south and not just uh, focus only on North. Yes, the North has a big responsibility, but also our own governments. And here it links with the fact of, of the financial flows. So I think we definitely need to keep on digging uh, deeper uh, and making this public. Because there is a lot of, uh, um, uh, not ignorance, <laughs> but uh, no, knowledge of, um, of, of these dynamics. And I'm sure many consumers would be definitely influenced by such information. Um, the fact that China has become such a, a big industrial, agro-industrial uh, uh, importer of meat is also showing how there are different dynamics going on in different parts of the world. But it's good to see that also citizens' movement uh, uh, have been having an impact and how these initiatives at the local level uh, could happen any, anywhere in the world and they plant a seed for, for slow transformation. That is, the, that is the problem, I think, that the, any transformation that we could have is going to take a little bit of time. And um, uh, uh, many, I think many thought that the pandemic would try to bring these changes quicker. Um, the farm to fork strategy seems to be a step on the way, although might not be perfect, but uh, at least it's something that is starting and could serve as an example. It's really unfortunate that there's still like so many co controversies and with, uh, with the different other agreements and the other policy in place. But uh, it sets, sets a precedent that, that things can change and that at the legislation level, there could be definitely a, a, an influence. Um, yeah, so... So yeah, I think the, the fact that uh, the EU Mercosur means further intensification while the farm to fork is looking for something that is more sustainable. So this, this kind of conflict could lead to, to better conditions or not, but uh, we, we try to think that it's going to be for, for the best. So it's definitely systemic change is definitely needed. Uh, as we have seen from the past dialogues the, in the in southern countries, these policies these policies are at the moment supporting mostly corporations. There is a big complicity between governments and corporations. Uh, the Global Trust Coalition issued a paper on perverse incentives back in uh, October 2018. And it showed, just like Kitana said, how these incentives don't necessarily, necessarily need to be in the form of direct uh, subsidies, but also the fact that they are allowing uh, cheaper 
uh, for example, uh, public services, electricity, or intellectual pop property rights. Uh, these kind of incentives <clears throat> are also allowing this industry to expand. So I think that the, that the corporations can uh, stop deforestation, but we have a big role we, I certainly don't know if consumers can stop this big agro from, from expanding, but I think uh, that we at least need to try it. And, as, uh, and it has been said, there needs to be more articulation. There needs to be a um, closer construction of, of force from all of us who work on these issues. The good thing is that now we are all meeting the different movements. So it's not just the food movement separated from the climate movement, separated from the trade movement, but that we all come together in order to curb this because as it was clearly established during the webinar, these are all uh, branches of one safe problematic, which is uh, capitalism and ne neoliberalism. And we definitely need a transformation. Uh, I don't know if someone else has something else to add. This would be all for me. Uh, apologies if I'm forgetting something, but I, I think that's a little bit of the wrap-up. Uh, the recording is going to be available in maybe one or two weeks in our YouTube channel, so you can see the webinar again if you missed something. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Isis. Uh... Do uh, anyone has uh, something to to add as uh, 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 addition, or uh, we trust Isis. Isis has uh, done a good job. Um, thank you, thank you all. Thank you, uh, the speakers: uh, Ines, uh, Stephanie, Daniel, Kirtana, Carolina, uh, Melinda, who is not here but uh, has sent her. Uh, presentation. We thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, good information, uh, truthful information. We appreciate your time uh, that you give us. Uh, and we hope that uh, we, you, you will be uh, with us. And then if we, we need you, we can call upon you again. Thank you for participants. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think this is very useful for, uh, for you. And we hope that uh, question will be uh, coming and then uh, we can share those questions with uh, the, the, the speakers and they can respond and we also share with you all uh, in our reports. Thank you once again. Uh, and I think uh, we have come to an end to this, uh, to this webinar. Uh, is this do, do you still have uh, something to to say uh, before we we close definitely or we just close you have the floor thank you thank you kwami thank you everyone thanks to the interpreters and uh, have a nice day evening afternoon etc bye 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 thank you all bye bye see you again we love you all. Bye-bye.